Welcome to Indoctrination, a weekly conversation series about protecting yourself from systems of control. I'm your host, Rachel Bernstein. Hi, everyone. Please go to patreon.com slash indoctrination to become a supporter of the show. I'm really excited about all of the things that we now are providing for you to thank you for your support. There are some wonderful bonus episodes and some of the guests have come back just to do them for you. And some new guests have come to do special bonus episodes for you. And you get great merchandise and also for $50 or more, you get to have a conversation with me once a month. And so there's going to be a cap of how many people We're going to be able to have at that level at any given time, but there is room for more people to sign up for that. And it's been really nice. And I can only speak for myself. It's been really nice for me to get to know you, to hear what your questions are, to get your feedback about things, for me to be able to address what's on your mind in a much more personal way. Even though I know a lot of you get what you're looking for by listening to the podcast. I know sometimes people will listen to a podcast and think, "Mm, it, it answered my question, but only to a certain degree. And I wish there were a way to find out more how how this person who is hosting this podcast would deal with my particular issue or answer my questions. And so this gives you a chance to do that. And so I'm excited to be able to provide it. So go to patreon.com slash indoctrination to become a supporter for $50 or more, and then we can set up those conversations. Today, I'm very excited to have Pamela Jackson on. She is a licensed clinical social worker, an LCSW, and a creative nonfiction writer. She specializes in therapy for adult women who have estranged or difficult relationships with their mothers. After leaving the ICOC cult, the International Church of Christ, Pamela attempted to repair her relationship with her mother. One of the main reasons she was vulnerable to the love bombing and manipulation of the ICOC. The mother-daughter conversations ultimately failed, but also became the inspiration for her private practice, supporting women to reparent themselves. Pamela has just completed her first memoir about the journey of mothering while unmothered. Some of her clients' stories and how leaving the cult eventually led her to find a mother within, as she calls it. Pamela earned a bachelor's from the New School, a master's degree in fine arts from Sarah Lawrence College, and a master's degree in social work from Silberman School of Social Work at Hunter College. She is a co-parent to her bold, joyful daughter, and we will post links where you can find her work and you can contact her. Here is Pamela now. I'm so happy to be able to have the chance to get to know Pam Jackson. I am very happy because one of the things that happens when people say, you know, I was involved in a particular group or I had a particular kind of parent or something is, it it is important to see how even if you had something similar to what other people had or you were in a similar group to what other people were in, you could still have your very own experience with it. And there's going to be some overlap, but there are going to be some distinct differences. And so each person has their unique kind of life from it and life experiences. So it's it's good. It's a good reminder not to assume that if someone says, oh, I have this kind of parent or I was in this kind of group that you can picture their life. You can't until you find out. And so I am very happy to be able to, to talk to you today. And I'd love you to spend a couple moments just introducing yourself, what you want to talk about today, and also a little bit about you now, what you're doing. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me here, Rachel. I was you know, listening to the conversation with um, Nikita and Asha um, about ICOC, and it was really great to listen. Um, and I also just brought up a lot of layers for me being 17 years removed 
from the church now. And, you know, I wanted to kind of share about some of the maybe potential things that one could avoid when they're leaving a cult. And just also, you know, I now, after being gone 17 years, am able to look back and track um, what my growth has been like, but also where I have fallen into some pitfalls of what may happen to one after they leave a cult. And I really felt excited and and, and feel like it was important to share that journey. Right now, I am a psychotherapist. Part of my specialty is working with daughters who are estranged from their mothers or had difficult relationships with them, whether they're uh, living or deceased. And honestly, that work has come from leaving the church. I joined ICOC two weeks after my father died. I was 16 years old. My mother at that point, you know, I, I put it this way. She was already just so dead to mothering. You know, um, she had three of us um, raising us alone. And it was very, um, very lonely trying to parent myself. And what I mean by that is I was approaching my junior year in high school and my school was very small, very arts driven. We were focused on getting into these schools. The students were known for getting into that were pretty um, premier institutions. And I had no one to guide me through this. So it was all the more prevalent, um, my need for parenting. And um, at the time I was working at the the container store, <laughs> this is my first job. And I smile because it was it was my first job in the container storage. Most people probably know it by now. It's a storage and organization store. When I started working there in 2000, you know, it was kind of just starting out. They had a very, very sharply run engine there. And I fit perfectly into it. Anyway, one of my colleagues was a disciple and he invited me to church, but he only invited me because he wanted to date me and couldn't unless I became a disciple. You know, that I, it's reminding me, I have friends who used to work at a store called Benetton. It was something very OCD about how everything needed to be just right. And that there were people who had OCD who would move up the ranks or they were just so, so, so uh, in need of uh, people pleasing that they would stay after hours refolding and making things uh, just perfect, lined up just perfectly. The container store always looks perfect to the point where it can make you nervous <laughs> that you're going to bump into something and knock it off a half an inch of, and and uh, tilt it a little bit but right if you're a people pleaser and you know you know how to do things just right to have someone be happy with you that is going to be a place where you can shine but also probably just feel like you have to stay to after hours to get it just right uh how interesting So the ICOC, just for people who haven't heard yet, the International Church of Christ, it's not affiliated with the mainline churches of Christ, and it's still in existence. And oftentimes the the deciding factor to know if it was part of the cultic group or not was if it started with the name of the city that was in like the Boston Church of Christ, Los Angeles, right? And Kip McKean is the one who originated it, and, and he was an interesting character. I'm wondering... First of all, about your experience in it. How old were you when you got involved? What was the draw into ICOC? So I was 16 when I started studying the Bible. And initially it was the coworker who invited me to come to the church. He was interested in me. I was interested in his attention on me. And so I went and I got scooped up by the teen ministry to start studying the Bible he uh, actually at the time was in the campus ministry and we had a five-year gap in our relationship. So they were very leery of him. And this, you know, what he did was very taboo in that space. So they very much kept me, tried to keep me away from him, but we worked together. So we would always overlap in that time. And so my studies dragged on for like nine months, which is, you know, in that space, unproductive. But then I got a phone call in April of 2000 from my great grandmother telling me that my father, um, uh, his pancreas busted and he had died. And he was living homeless for the last year of his life. And so then I became the one to tell everyone in the family, you know, daddy died, daddy died. I remember telling my mother walking into her room and my mother was already very histrionic. Um, and so she was just like, oh my God, no, like that was my one true love. And so I, she was just raging and I left her there. Then I went and told my twin sister and she was like, daddy died. She, no, he didn't. I said, no, I just got the call. Like grandma, great grandma Ruth told me, like daddy died. No, he didn't. You're lying. And I was like, okay. And so I have to say this part. My sister in that moment was in a state of denial. 
But I have to applaud her incredibly because from that moment and for a while after she went into a very dark and, and gray space to the point where she like literally painted her room gray and black, she did some things that showed she was obviously not only devastated, but sincerely grieving, like really grieving. Meanwhile, after the funeral, two weeks later, I became a disciple. So I mentioned the juxtaposition of the way I, I chose to grieve, I'm putting quotes, because, but really I was just in shock. I chose to grieve by excelling, by what I thought was excelling. I, I chose to grieve. And it really was that sense that my mother really is not present as a mother. She just can't be. My mother was very abusive verbally and physically and, you know, vacillated between um, me being her favorite and me being a piece of crap. And I had always kept in my mind this daydream of my father coming to find me, find us and and parent me, like come from down south. And and now I want to raise my kids. I've moved down the street kind of thing and and I'm going to take care of them with you. So when I got the call that he died, this daydream that I was going to be raised by a parent in a reliable and consistent and loving way was dead. But I didn't tell myself that, you know, at the forefront, I decided it's time to join ICLC now. It's, and so for nine months, I had been dragging all my studies. They wanted me to do all these things, leave my boyfriend and um, all this. So I, I did everything they wanted me to do to become a disciple within two weeks. Incredible. Incredible. Okay. So hold that thought. A <laughs> couple of things about that story. You know, a lot of people will say I got involved in something after something occurred, after there was a loss, after I was diagnosed with something, after something happened that disrupted my life, that really pierced a bubble. I mean, I think about you dreaming of your father being able to be a rescue hero and then to find out that he is no longer. Oh, oh, devastating. I'm wondering about him being homeless, and I don't know, you don't have to share about why that was, but it's an interesting thing for your mom to say, that's the love of my life. Meanwhile, he was living on the street. Right. We left him when I was five in Georgia one night, putting all our, through all of our clothes in trash bags because he was having a psychotic break. We were all in this nice single family home. Oh God, I love that house in Decatur, Georgia, the backyard um, playground set and and we were all together, but my dad was doing drugs then and moving my mom into it. But my mother had um, my grandparents, a mother and a father. And so she did come from like some form of stability. She did have that to go to um, and also probably had that as a point of reference for reaching a limit and not going. Past. So he was on drugs and an alcoholic and he was threatening to kill her that night. And he told her, you know, yeah, the voices are telling me to kill you. and. So she had us flee that night when I was five and we left him there. But I still had the, so he would call me from rehab, tell me, you know, you're my pumpkin. I love you. So that fed into my daydreaming of like, daddy's going to get better one day and be stable enough to save me from all of my mom's depression and vacillating, um, live, uh, vacillating from anger um, or I'm your fate. You're my favorite to your, you're nothing. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So to have a, a a father who really had some issues, poor guy, right? Who's really battling a lot, but still called you pumpkin, which has is in, inordinately warm and fatherly. And so, you know, I I feel like there are people who just don't get a fair shake. Like they don't get a chance to be who they really could be, and they really want to be. And so it sounds like that kind of warmth you being called a pet name wasn't your relationship with your mother. My mother actually called me pumpkin. We had, so we had, she called me pumpkin as well. We had a very warm relationship. The problem is, is, um, you know, my, my, my mother used me as a partner. She, you know, she, she, um, she had me uh, emotionally take the place of my father. So I would be present for her suicidal ideation um, while she was in the hot tub and, you know, in her baths, crying out to God around all the torturous things that happened. I mean, literally from just leaving the love of her life. So they were madly in love, my mother and, and my father. So I definitely felt um, her pain. I just was exposed to too much of it. And so, and she allowed me to be in way too close proximity. So I remember just 
And I felt this way. I was sitting, I would be in the bathroom corner, tucked in the, in the, you know, snuggling myself into this nook, watching her in deep sorrow. And I thought, well, somebody needs to be here, you know, that people please you were mentioning. Somebody needs to be here to, to support her. And I think it's just the sight of that torture that it's very magnetizing to watch. It's, it sounds strange, but to see my mother asking to leave this planet I felt like I shouldn't, I can't go anywhere right now. And I'm going to be the one, at at the very least, my presence will maybe inspire her to see what she has. That is what kept me in the room. In addition to being in shock that she would allow me to be exposed to so much torture, you know. Wow. You know, there are these uh, kids, we will often call them the parentified child. And that they take on that role of the parent, of the other parent, or sometimes to parent their parent. And sometimes it happens because of your wiring, because of your conscience, because you lean in when someone needs you, when your mom needs you. And and yes, it is magnetizing. It's so interesting that you describe it that way. You got drawn in to just, I think, probably making sure, reading her, making sure that just by your presence, she was going to get calm. And then you'd feel like you were able to have some impact on her just by being there. Also, having your siblings not be there. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like, tag, you're it. I mean, if everyone had been there, you might have felt like you could go play for a little while. But it's an interesting thing, the roles that people take on. So, mm-hmm. but a great sense of responsibility, which is a lot of pressure. So from that, from the, all the family discord, the emotion, the raw emotion here, you were needing something. You were needing something for you. Yeah. I was deeply wanting to be parented. So when I joined, believe it or not, within the first couple of months, my discipler at the time, whom I was paired with, she lost her father at 16 as well. And she was older than me. I was a teenager, you know, so she was older than me. But it was like we were, you know, I don't I don't even know if that was intentional, but there was this, you know, this sense of like, I have a comrade. I have someone who understands me, you know, but it's so twisted because my actual pain and my my loss wasn't dealt with. In fact, I remember when my father died, the tactics are terrible. His death was like used as part of the catalyst, as part of the inspiration to get me to get very serious about, finally serious about getting baptized, about doing what I needed to do to become a disciple. I remember asking him, do you think he made it to heaven? And I remember the answer, I remember getting this answer. Well, I can't, can't really say, Pam, you know, and, and then being re- referred to what scripture says a disciple is. Like, can you say your dad was this, did this? And I remember being inspired by that fear. Like, I don't want to end up like my father. Meanwhile, I'm joining here because I want, uh, I want this parenting presence. But I was going to a performing arts high school, which I mentioned, you know, I, I'm in my, my my junior year trying to figure out what college I'm going to go to. And I told my discipler about the school I went to, she already knew, but it was an arts-based school in D.C. I, I love my school, Duke Ellington School of the Arts. It's amazing. So in order to stay in it, um, I was lying. Um, I lived in Maryland, but I was using my godfather's Washington, D.C. address in order to go because Ellington requires out-of-state tuition if you are not a resident. And I informed my discipler of that. And she told me that I was, you know, being deceitful and going against the laws and things. And I knew that I was, that's why I was like confessing to her. But her her answer was that I would find a way to start paying the seven, at that time, $7,000 a year tuition, which my my mother um, did not have the money or I had to um, move out because the church had found a way for me to live with um, disciples who lived in Washington, D.C. So within a couple months at 17, I'm moving. I literally, I'm I'm searching for a home in this church, wanting to be parented, and they literally uproot me and have me go live with one of the uh, teenage disciples who ended up um, at that same year joining my school, uh, getting accepted into Ellington. So we were going there together. So it seemed perfect. I'm also, I'm a junior in high school. I don't know what I'm doing. And you're having me, you're telling me I need to move out of home. And so I, I moved out. And then within a few weeks later, this same disciple was telling me I needed to leave my poetry performance, group, which was the thing. The poems have been my were up until joining the church, um, my lifeboat. They were what helped me. I would, I would write poems to my mother. 
And it was like, she was the first person I would give poems to. And she was so proud and felt uplifted by them. And I remember feeling, um, you know, you see your parents' joy. And so you, I, it just affirmed my identity around it. But I ended up using writing as a way of working through the trauma in my house. There's a lot of different types of violence going on. And so the poetry performance group was my, they were my second family, hands down. They were, you know, artists, a lot of artists use their art as a buffer for the trauma they're experiencing, but also as a vehicle vehicle to cleanse while you're in it. And it kept doing that for me. It literally, it kept telling me what I was going to do or able to do next, rather than fall into some of the negative situations that my friends around me were falling into because they were in some of the same traumas I was going through. Writing always kept me on course. That's how I ended up at Ellington. So then my disciple tells me that I needed to leave this poetry group because it met Wednesday nights. And that was midweek service night. And also because the writing would probably tempt me into sin, being around the other poets and the content, the subjects. So I had to leave them too. But I was willing because I, I was willing to exchange what I felt was my identity and for to me in order to feel like I had parents. And I remember being taught once, you know, it was Father God, that's clear. I'm going to this Father God that they're pointing me towards. But then I also learned that God considers the church his wife. And I was, well, there's not, this is like, and I'm operating off metaphor. I let metaphor was like divine for me. I really bought in. So I was willing to exchange my sense of self for, for feeling my home. Right. I don't have to tell you about how maddening that all is. Right. Because I'm sure you felt it and I'm sure you feel it in retrospect. When you're at, I know one of my kids was at a performing arts high school, you get very close. You reveal yourself. You kind of unzip, right? You say, this is me. This is all of me. And then you have this kind of radical acceptance and it is a beautiful thing. I'm glad that you had that even for a short time. I'm wondering if you still have the poems that you wrote to your mom. I mean, I know that those are deeply personal things. No, no, I wish I did. I tried to remember one of them because I was I was about the clouds in the sky. But I know that those poems have found their way into my writing and sort of converted into it, especially in the memoir that I've just written, which is about the, the relationship between the ground and the sky. So, but no, I don't literally have them. Okay. And maybe what, what they were for was what they were for, that they were for that time and for that person. And that's okay. But I'm glad, I'm glad to hear actually that you're still writing and that's very good. And we're going to talk about that. Okay. But yes, the father, mother, family, the symbolism, all of it. So you got involved, you made sacrifices, sacrifices that they never should have asked you to make, but they did. And that happens time and time again in these groups. It's really unconscionable. And here you were, and it probably felt important or necessary or safe. What did it give you, at least at first? Honestly, structure. Structure was very comforting. Your schedule was just planned out Sunday through Sunday. And then it gave me, um, it just, it, it reinforced the effort to find my validation through how I perform well for others. That that was what was happening at, with, at home with me and my mom because I was like winning awards and things for my poems. And so she got prouder and prouder of me, but that was when I saw her the happiest. So I just translated that over to the church um, and I would get, it was neurotic. I was absolutely neurotic around sharing my faith and around bringing uh, potential converts to church to the point that my discipler told me, you got to calm down, like, it's okay. But I was like, no, <laughs> no, you don't understand. Like this is, this, this is how I'm going to get you all to see me as important. But I'm also being told that this is what you want. And everything else about me, my father dying, my, the, the fact that I, I, I believe poetry is an extension of myself, those things are being negated. So I'm assuming this is what I need to make you proud of me. So I, I, um, that I was drawn into the the very clear expectations, very you know this creed, this creed um, that we had, and honestly, that it's it's huge because I really didn't I didn't have that as a child. I didn't have structure and guidance, and and you know this is not to demonize my mother or mothers you know who are in this place of being single moms and having a mental illness because this comes you know my mother is definitely narcissistic and. Even saying that, 
you're I feel like I'm telling a secret I'm not supposed to tell, you know. Um, but meanwhile, I have this inner child in me that is I've been helping her over these few years. I understand you, you, um, you don't have to stay in the basement anymore is what I can tell her. We used to live in my grandmother's basement when we left my father. And and so it was just you know, this very dark place where we would pick our clothes out of those trash bags. Our clothes remain in those trash bags for years, but that's also where a lot of the yelling and the beating happened. And so I'm like, you don't have to, you don't have to stay there anymore. You can tell, you can tell. Anyway, um, and I should say, you know, I'm kind of compelled to talk about my the the work I did with my mom. Sure, of course, yeah. I'm just I'm picturing I'm I have the visual of you in a basement and picking your clothes out of garbage, and that that's where you're saying the yelling and the beating. I mean, it is it's dark on a lot of levels, but just not feeling set up in your life, and not being able to just take things out of drawers. I mean, there is a very different feeling about. Yes, it is chaotic. And it feels temporary and and not quite solid and sure. So no wonder the structure that ICOC provided really spoke to you. I'm really understanding that a lot more now. Okay, but go ahead. Talk about talk about that. So when I left the church, one of the things that one of the things that I noticed I needed to do was um, try to repair my relationship with my mother. I was a student at Sarah Lawrence getting my MFA in creative nonfiction, which was big for me because that was my attempt to find my voice again as a writer. I fell in love. I did go to undergrad for writing as well. So while I was a disciple, I was going to undergraduate. I literally was going to school across the street from where the church met. So I went to the new school. The church met right on 12th and 6th. And the church met at the elementary school in 12th and 6th. So the new school, if you know it, is one of the premier institutions for race, class, and gender. Very leftist, very heretical. Meanwhile, as I'm learning like about oppression and what it means to be marginalized and voiceless. And then I'm going to ICOC across the street and like having all of this radical philosophy taught to me and the hierarchy that I'm supposed to find myself within. And it was such a crazy split of a world. So I was doing that (laughs) once I, um, but it started to clash with like the artist in me started rising out more. And I'm going to get some other daughter thing, but all this is connected because I, so I wanted to get some artists together who were disciples, who felt like we need to express ourselves more through our artistic vein. And we met informally. And I went to the women's ministry leader after our meeting and told her, you know, we want to kind of get a group together um, of artists, you know, so we can we can try to sh- show our creativity in church. And she said, you already met? I was like, oh, yeah, no, it's just, just an informal meeting. And she said, the leader is the leader of this church. Any group that meets is under the leader of this church. I was like, oh yeah, no, no, we are, we were just getting together. She's like, and she repeated herself, any group that meets is under the leadership of her husband. This is the woman's mm-hmm. ministry leader talking to me. Mm-hmm. And her stairwell, no one's around. And she just gets more and more frozen as she like focuses and targets me. And I remember the church taught me that sin is missing the mark like an archer. But I felt like I was her mark, like she was not going to miss. So I let, uh, a couple of weeks later, I was at make week service. And I, I remember um, we were starting, we were starting service and we're singing and everyone is moving in this motion, you know, symbiotically, everyone was together. And I remember moving with them, but noticing this wave and like, I don't want to be a part of this wave anymore. And I remember thinking, I know what the next, next song is going to be. I don't want to know what the next song is going to be. And I don't think I even like it. I turned to this sister and I was like, I got to go. And she just kind of like nodded and smiled at me, but made sure to maintain her rhythm with the wave. And I broke out and I walked out. And I remember passing the leader, the women's ministry leader. And she looked at me and she was counseling some other woman at that time. And she said goodbye. Mind you, I'm going the opposite direction. Of I'm headed to the doors while church service is starting. And I looked at her and I said, goodbye. And we knew I wasn't coming back because she certainly never reached out to me. So I went, I just went home. But when I got home, I I just sat on the edge of my bed. I, I sat in silence for 18 months. I was just depressed. And so 
trying to find my way back to writing was my one of my ways of of um, trying to save myself. And so I applied to Sarah Lawrence um, because I, I fell in love with creative nonfiction while I was at the new school um, learning to tell my story. I, I didn't go there to do um, creative nonfiction. I just I came to do fiction writing, but I was very drawn to true story and while I was in the church, uh, my boyfriend at the time, my boyfriend I had at the church, he died suddenly um, at 21 years old. And so I actually ended up writing about that in a memoir class. And I just got very drawn to telling your story, which is how I started writing poetry. So I tried to pursue that when I left the church at Sarah Lawrence. And I ended up studying oral history. And it led me to create a conversation guide um, between, for my mother and I to try to heal our story. and. I did it a month after my grandmother died because my grandmother was the glue. She was the thing that kept me and my mother tolerating each other. And once she died, it was very clear, like the chasm that existed between my mother, you know, me and my mother without that mentor or that mediator there as my grandmother. But I felt, I heard my grandmother's spirit saying, you know, we don't do this. We don't stay estranged like this. Because I, 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 I told my mother, you're not my mother anymore. After she had done one of her another one of her outbursts and was accusing me of being jealous of my little sister. And my little sister's always had a very committed father in her life. Um, Her dad has been the best version of stepdad I've ever known. He's like her best friend and like, and I'm so happy for them. But my mother thought I was jealous, like you're just jealous. And so I just had it, it was just a, and that's putting it, that's just a slight example of how hurtful my mother would get. So I was like, you're not my mom anymore. Then my grandmother died and I felt my grandmother, I was just her, she would put you on guilt trips. So I felt her spirit. And so I tried to use the skills that I gained from oral history to see how can I merge this with my mother and I telling our stories. So we started doing that um, in 2010 for a year. Um, We would meet once a month. She wrote down um, a list of moments that she remembered from our past that had hurt her. I wrote down a list of moments from my past that I remember hurt me. I told her we should we need to do this to get down what was still stuck to our emotional bodies that we just couldn't shake. And we would meet one session, one conversation at a time around that moment. Um, and my idea was that we can't try to take on the whole relationship. But if we look at one moment at a time, it's like taking a slice out of a, a pie. We have all the ingredients of what we're really working with, but in a manageable bite size, size. And I have to tell you, Rachel, oh my God, that work I did with my mom for that, it was 11 months. It was probably the highest I've ever been. Like I was I was so happy. I was so, I felt free. Even talking about it now, I have a a spot in my body I identify as like my trauma spot where all like, where I get very activated and a sense of electricity pours. But that same spot when I feel liberated has this cooling sensation that happens. That's what's happening for me right now. Talking to my mother made me, I felt galactic. I felt like we were, we were actually stars. Like, you know, we were made of stars. We, we were, we talked about that. We would be, surpassed roles of mother, daughter, and we were like our true spirits, like past selves. It was powerful, but it also had to be because it fit the high highs and the low lows that we would go through. And it was just as neurotic as the neurosis and how galactic the church felt for me when I was joining, right? So I was, um, without knowing it, and this is one of the pitfalls, um, recreating the ICOC dynamic of this, like, perf- everything's perfect now. And here's the structure we need to just clean everything out. And, and you know, and, and, and not really making room for normalizing your existence is important just because you exist. That's it. Like, we don't have, things are not necessarily going to be wrapped in this bow and perfect. But after end, at the end of each session, we felt, you know, it was just, this was so um, not only liberating, but we felt we were really repairing and that we were perfecting our relationship. But if you have some undealt with trauma and you're trying to heal a relationship specifically um, that has narcissism in it, um, you're just reinforcing the rhythm of high and low if that wound isn't getting dealt with. So my mother and I cra- crashed at some point after that year. Um, we got back into her um, making me feel like I was an unwanted family member, 
you know, my 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 writing and things like that had already sort of set me apart, um, set me apart in, in my cohort of like siblings and family. And, and I just was like different, but she, you know, was using that against me. So our work did not work, Rachel. It didn't work, but it helped me understand, oh my God, I know what I was trying to do then. Like I was trying to kind of have that work save me. You know, I was I was trying to get my mother back. I was trying to get a parent back into my life. And um, and who doesn't want that? And I get that, but um, not everyone is afforded, unfortunately, a parent that has the emotional ability to really be there for you. And so for me, I was running from the fact that the church left me. When I left the church, I was left to deal with myself and I didn't know how to do that. I was left with having to like mother and parent myself and I didn't know how to do that. So I was trying to use this vehicle to have my mother like shape her up. You know, like I was going to go in with all my savior complex and like I was going to make her become the mother that I needed her to be through the mother-daughter work and we were going to be great and we were going to be the poster children, you know, a poster child for how you heal mother-daughter relationships. No, that didn't work. Just that idea of applying that kind of technique and magical thinking to something very real, something very terrestrial, tangible. It's not in the stars. It's right there in front of you. It can feel like the high can make you feel like you're floating above. But in real time, you're seeing the limitations of that. It's very real in the way you're talking about it. It's really devastating. It, it can feel like a real crash from that level of intensity. But it's there's something so pure about what you were wanting and what you were needing, what you were hoping for. And what you might have felt along the way that you were getting to a certain degree. But what helped you know that it wasn't quite fixing things? I'm so glad you asked me that because this bringing up the hesitation that I still struggle with the, oh no, I don't want to, I don't want to say something bad about her, right? Like, but, and being able to call out, um, but my mother got back into her same patterns, um, filled with rage and saying the worst things you can imagine to me. Um, when she was filled with rage. So we would have bouts of that. When I say we would have, my pattern was to just like listen. But then um, once I left the church, I told her, um, you can't, you can't talk to me that way anymore. And it actually started with me telling her, you can't tell me I'm your favorite anymore. That's inappropriate. I started telling her what was inappropriate, which is big for a narcissist, you know, to to define um, a boundary um, and name that something that they're doing is, is really not okay. So we got back into our pattern of, or her pattern of attacking me uh, and then wanting um, forgiveness and specifically wanting for it to be forgotten about. That's really what I was going for in the, the mother-daughter conversation was accountability and that we weren't going to act like a thing wasn't a thing anymore and that we were going to talk about it. But we went back into her uh, gaslighting and, and no, that didn't happen. Or I didn't say it or I didn't mean it that way. You're being too sensitive. So we found ourselves right back in, in those patterns. Yeah. You know, there's something very real about noticing also um, that you can't make someone else change. You can want it. You can change. You can hope that you see a little bit of change in them. But when they go back to their patterns, it's it's hard not to feel hopeless. That often does go along with it. And then you kind of shift and see what other goals you can have that might then feel a little more realistic in terms of having a relationship with this person. And I knew we were going back to Rachel when um, the mother-daughter work started getting looped into our old patterns. So let's just, we need a session. Let's have a session about this, Pam, right? My, um, so my mother began to use that conversation technique as a means of regaining closeness and intimacy with me. So after I established some distance so that we, I didn't keep going back into a sense of obligation. So I knew that there was like, this is manipulative. And now we're this thing that, you know, I thought that we had created from this, this pure place or that I created and we were putting into this platform to create a pure relationship between us was now getting used as a part of the armor to um, rebuild. Oh, yeah. I mean, you're so insightful in the way you can look at it. It's hard when you're in it to see what's going on. So then what happened next? So let's continue on with the chronology from there. Yeah. 
I started to have this urge to um, support women. Um, I felt it was really necessary that women start to deal with their voice, but specifically deal with the impact that their mother's voice might be having on their own voice and any enmeshment and entanglement might that might be there that might be causing like real confusion around defining themselves. So I started doing like college programming, but I'm turning what my my real the things I actually care about, like healing women and 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 tending to the mother daughter wound i i cared about those things but i also quickly commercialized them i also quickly made them into commodities what i also did was i, I started um groups and this is where one of the pitfalls i think one of the things you have to avoid when you leave out of a cult is not only looking at the vulner- the ways you were vulnerable and how they were able to bring you in but also how your You've got to start from your experience versus starting over. So I was looking at my experience and my experience was in the ICOC in these groups. But I wasn't able to see until I until recently that I was trying to recreate these group dynamics after leaving. And so I created a sister circle and like I had it, to, it had such such like I had I had an open space where I just wanted us women to gather, but I realized I was also creating like discipleship groups basically all over again. Where I had these expectations that I wanted of the women, and I wanted them to be a certain way, and I wanted our conversations to be a certain way. At the same time, I was creating programming that was empowering college women in particular to go through a eight phase program. I was creating um, called She Thrives that helped them notice what their inner home felt like. And what they were doing um, on the outside to cater to that inner home. Um, they had to look at their relationship. They had to look at their sense of purpose. Um, and we had a, a whole mother-daughter section where they got to understand what it means to mother yourself. Uh, especially for those who had like mothering wounds where their mothers weren't able to be present in their lives the way they wanted. Good was happening, but I, I did want to underscore that. I do think it's important to look out for when you're taking your the real issues that you're seeing in yourself and they become, um, when it becomes more important how you're selling that versus how you're healing it. Right, right. Oh, yeah. I mean, what's also true is that, you know, when going back to the ICOC, there is so much about it that is sales. And, you know, you have people who are living a life that is not a happy life in in that group. I mean, they're they might feel happy sometimes, but they've often sacrificed things. They've given up a lot. They don't have a lot of resources left. They're exhausted, but they're recruiting for this and talking a good line about how you're going to have a life of whatever purpose, meaning, et cetera. You know, but where is the health? Where is that calm place in, inside uh, that should be? You know, and that real secure place inside that should actually be more important. So I think it happened to you in a repeated way. It's an interesting thing with sales. Well, I mean, I I specifically chose my partner and I told myself, and it was a secret I kept to myself. I said the disciples would like him. My brain was still operating off of that space as a point of reference for what success looked like. And what a good person was and and what a good catch would be because it was like this idea of fishers of men. And I remember the the disciples would like him. So I was really still operating off of approval. So the big shift for me, you know, once I um, started writing, I ended, um, I got out of my my marriage. Um, Actually, my husband divorced me, which was very important. Uh, it's deep for me to say, but also important because I was so willing to work harder than I should have. And I was also very much dying inside, but still willing to to do more. And I, the, the, that was also from the church of like, okay, I really, I can, I can do this. I can make this work. So I, I give homage. I, I'm grateful that that ended, but when, but I also, once I moved out, I moved out Two weeks after we decided to, he decided to end it. And that was what broke me out. I was finally living on my own. It was for the first time I was living on my own. And this is, you know, after the women's programming, um, once I got pregnant with my daughter, I felt this sense that, oh my gosh, I need to be able to take care of myself plus her in case anything happens with this marriage, because I was going through the highs and lows, highs and lows, highs and lows that I have with my mom. And that was, you know, similar to the church. And so I, 
it came, I, I went to school for social work because I was really good at listening to people and really great at being this counselor. And um, since I was a kid, because I was groomed for that with my mom, and I was like, well, one of the things that I've learned that's important is that savior complex that, you know, we can get into. I decided, okay, well, I'm I'm no longer going to allow my relationships, my personal relationships to tap into me from this like counselor space. I'm no longer going to allow my um my, you know, intimate relationships to utilize me. I'm going to get paid for this. And I'm going to have clear boundaries around the kind of intimacy you can form with me. So it's actually I try to really make I think that's something to really watch out for as well is um when you're coming out of a cult going into professional work that is in response to it, but making sure that the response is self-determining. It's from self-determination versus in, versus in, um, in some form of entanglement still within that space, if that makes sense. Because I can easily be a therapist and be doing it out of um, a traumatized space Right. Um, because I know what it means to help. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to be a helper for a living. I was like, no, yes, I do that well, but I'm going, I'm going to not do that in my personal life and I'm going to get paid for it. That is what I'm going to do. That was very point of power and pivoting, um, of shift for me into my own power. So that happened. And that was as a result of getting pregnant with my daughter. And that is folding into this latter half of, of, of the child of my life right now. After moving out, I was getting, I started my practice um, entirely um, and it's been in, in virtual um, always, but I, my full private practice, I started. And that is when I started to really study uh, complex post-traumatic stress disorder, which is, you know, repeated trauma over time and what it means to um, really try to find that inner child that is, has normalized abandonment, but is also, you know, vacillates between abandonment and like immersing themselves in approval. Um, and trying to find that. So started to do that work because clients needed it. And then it was just this huge mirror. So like, uh, I think it's super key to make sure, again, if you're coming out of these culture spaces, uh, these spaces, and you're trying to create another platform for yourself out of it, that you are really, really looking at deep down that this is breaking real um, patterns for you and not just appearing to you know, you know, you have a lot of knowledge, but it's got to be working at a deep, deep level for you. So I am super grateful that when I became a therapist in order to use my skills and have folks pay me for it and not be abused in that way. But two, that my, my work with my clients has deeply caused me to not only repair, but honestly feel like I'm healing from my trauma because I'm facing a mirror a lot of times when their stuff comes up and I'm like, oh my God. So I started to do CBTSD on myself and it made me find that 16 year old who joined the ICOC and I thought she was dead. I like buried her. You know, when I baptized, I was like, well, she's dead. And I now I find myself in the first time in my own home weeping over finding her and and all of her poems and like her love for her, vo- her, her, her poetic voice and giving her space to cry out and mourn for what was lost. And being able to tell her it's okay, you have room here to acknowledge that that hurt. Because one of the things that happened when I left the church was that my friends who had left, because I was constantly finding friends who I was connected to who were disciples, and then they left. And I was like, this is a sign of everybody I bond with is leaving. But they also told me they were thriving when they left for each other. And I was like, I'm in depression. I'm sad. And one of them said, well, maybe you need to go back. And I remember taking that on. So I would fast forward when I'm with the 16 year old I found, she was able to like take the time that she felt she needed to grieve because she would at that time was being told when I left, like, this is something's wrong with you if you're that this sad over this. Then I found my father, my grief for my dad, finally, thing that inspired me to join the church but came through becoming a, a therapist and giving myself these tools. I saw, oh gosh, now I can actually. Now I can mourn what was really going on with me because I had been on autopilot. So this was a, such a, a story of reclamation in terms of, um, and it was my being getting pregnant with my daughter that launched me into like, okay, how am I going to turn um, my skills and all this stuff that I've used to be this great bandwidth for everyone else and in, in, into being able to, to use on use on myself. And I didn't even plan it that way for some, one, I had some plans around initially, but then the later stuff just 
found me. It met me right in the mirror. So I'm super grateful to my, my, my work. And then, and then I, so I start, so mother daughter, I learning about the inner child through the complex post-traumatic stress disorder sort of helped me really start to hear all of the um, terrible messages from my mom when I was little that I just quieted down. And I started to um, let myself have the space to heal that and then work with my clients through it. And I, cre- I started to create different um, exercises that allowed them to uh, address these wounds in themselves. Um, one of the main ones that's a part of my memoir is a chapter called The Empty Room, Enter the Empty Room. And The Empty Room is really an intensive visualization exercise that allows you to place the part of yourself that's hungry for saviors and validation, that's hungry for like people to tell you you're beautiful, you're smart, or um, all the spaces and, 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 pl- and individuals that in your life, you find it very, very hard to not feel addicted to their approval. They're outside the room. And in the room, the door is closed and it's you, the person that, the part of you that's addicted to those, those sources of approval and standing at the door of that room is the friend in you. A part of you who not only like understands where you're at, but she knows who you can be because she's been there. So it's the part of you that's like the sister in yourself. You know, we talk about inner child work. I realized that I needed more than at some stage because I did so much good nurturing of my child. At some point, I needed more than inner child work. I needed to meet myself. I needed to be eye to eye with Pam, if that makes sense. (laughs) Right, right, right. Yeah. So yeah, this book, I started writing about being a mom, mothering while unmothered, having the goals to um, not treat my child how my mom treated me, of course, but also seeing that, well, what made me so vulnerable to the church was, you know, this relationship, this lacking with with my parent. So I wanted to, uh, this memoir um, has been really important because I, I started to see in my daughter um, her own emptiness after the divorce with my ex-husband and her own rage and her own self-hate. She said, at one point, I hate myself. And I was like, wow, how can I be a therapist with a daughter who hates themselves? And then I'm like, oh, this is what we need to look into the mirror about. This is not about how it looks. This is about how things feel. We're going to look at how this feels. You're feeling empty. Why wouldn't she feel empty? Because I going through the withdrawal of leaving another savior, which was my husband, my ex-husband. And I was, well, she's withdrawing from, her, from the family dynamic. I'm withdrawing from the source that I use to perpetuate this dependence. Mm-hmm. I really had to like, and I've been, and also give, give myself grace because for so long I had been groomed to believe that that was the way to live, to believe in a savior outside of myself. Right. But it ended up being this huge space of acceptance and being able to also um, normalize the success of my, the, like my existence is important just because I exist and that that's successful. I, I don't have to go for, um, I can go for like glimmers over glamour. Glimmers, I learned like, this is term and I wrote it down because I wanted to share it with you. When your body is grounded and you feel at peace inside, it's, it's a glimmer. It's from Deb Dana. Uh, who is a uh, apparently a gifted nervous system practitioner. She uh, defined glimmers as glimmers are opposites of triggers. They're moments when our nervous system is grounded and we fully, we are fully at peace inside of our body. So as glimmers are what other people refer to as the flow state. Um, And when we're fully in the body, we feel open, grounded and connected and our mind is racing or fearing or or in the future or thinking the worst case scenarios instead we are being. And I just had to get comfortable with my being because I was so used to earning my sense of worth, you know, from being the favorite child or from getting um, a lot of uh, people to convert to the to the church, or bringing in, you know, bringing in, sharing my faith and trying to be the best disciple, and then trying to do that in my marriage, like, oh, I, I can start this and this, I can lead this group and start this program. Meanwhile, am I able to be at peace within Pam and be fine with my existence? As is, this morning I was dropping my daughter off at school. And she has a performance tonight, Rachel, for Modern Dance. And she's been like excelling. Like, you know, when you notice this might be a thing, like you've got talent. She did this move recently that she made up herself. So I had to hold myself back. Like I was pulling in the reins on the inside to not ask her, what spot do you have on stage? 
Oh, oh, right, right. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I was catching myself like wanting to know if she's in the front. Right. But I'm so happy that I could, you know, that I could hear that. I could see that I could slow. I was slowed down long enough to be able to reorient and choose silence and and versus reinforcing uh, for her, which would this pattern of caring more about how things look than how they feel, because truly she loves what she and she's in this state of like. This feels good, mom. Most of my friends want to do this for like professional when they become um, adults and they want to do it as a career. I just like, I just like doing, I just like dancing. And I'm like, great. Had I been like, what spot are you? What, what's, what's your spot on the stage? It would have reinforced this message or taught her, okay, mom cares about me being in the front. Right. That's exactly right. Exactly right. You know, it's interesting. There's the author, speaking about writers, uh, Joan Didion who's fantastic. She and Anne Lamott. I love Anne Lamott. So Joan Didion, her her daughter Quintana went to school with me, I remember. And then her daughter died at a young age. And, but I remember a quote by Joan Didion. I don't, I didn't know her personally. She came to school for a parents back to school thing, which blew my mind, but she has a quote and I'm going to paraphrase it because it's longer than this, but it's basically that she found herself walking along the beach one day waiting for someone to rescue her, waiting for someone to come up to her and notice her sorrow and take care of her. And as she walked and she walked and she walked, she realized that person was her and that that she was the one who was going to rescue her. And it was just beautiful. And I, re- I was reminded of that as you were talking. So moved by that. I can see it too. I love Joan. And I, and I make that makes so much sense to me because to take the pen to the page or type whatever and because you feel like with each I don't know how she felt but for me it's um um like you each letter each your sentence you're digging up all these layers on purpose and then you're finding things underneath the surface that you did not plan on discovering and it keeps taking you deeper and I'm just so impressed by her um the will the will to do that I didn't have the will to do that for over a decade, I ran from my father's death. You know, like my father died when I was 16. I did not deal with his death until my mid-30s. But yes, yeah, saving myself, honestly, has been finding the vehicle of writing again. And the writing has helped me, while feel re-traumatized um, in different ways because, but it, uh, but it also meant me facing things that I've been sitting there had I not. And if I wouldn't look at them, then I would keep perpetuating the ways that I was doing the savior saved dynamic, you know, saving my mom. And now I'm at, now I'm seeking to be saved and now I'm seeking to be saved. And- well, I, I love the way that you think about things. I love the way you've really explored things. You've really looked at them and looked at them again. And it takes a lot of bravery to dive in, especially also when you're saying that you're writing about it because you go in and you need to edit and you need to revisit it and feel it again and experience it again. And, uh, oh, it takes a lot. It takes a lot. Just as we're finishing up, was there anything else that you wanted to make sure to mention? And then I also want people to, to know where they can find you or your writings or your work. You know, I I think it's very important. And I, I was looking at this note because I made a note. Um, openings of desire. I really want to encourage folks to pay attention to um what they crave and what they find in pleasure in. I really think desire is such a great source of diffusing fawning and the ways that we can unintentionally keep ourselves enslaved in the savior saved complex. When you have more of a curiosity around your desires and where the openings are for them, it just starts to shift and turn that like a, you know, this huge tanker that's in the sea that, you know, it's just a small rudder that shifts its course. That's openings of desire do that like even little things like yesterday I sat on the couch and watched Seinfeld because I felt like I had just a moment and I was giggling Rachel and this like giggle deep down and I was like oh what I needed you know um and and it can it just ripples out into bigger bigger things of oh I know I have a after I I I I I go to my desire closer towards it now I know I have the right to do this I have the right to do that this sense of entitlement from a healthy place can grow. So yeah, that's something I want to leave folks with. Um, 
Yeah, you can find me at um, uh, alamothering.org. You can also find me on Instagram at pamela.s.jackson. I am in the spot right now of shopping around my book. Um, So I'm seeking to get it published. It is a kind of a genre-defying memoir. So it's a story of mothering while unmothered, as well as um, helping my daughter be able to um, find her way out of self-hate while I heal my own emptiness and the emptiness is, you know, part of that emptiness is where the ICOC story is told. That's soon to come. Um, and I would love to share, I'll be having on those sites where you can find me, those places you can find me, there'll be more information about that as the book comes. Uh, and I just started writing on medium.com. I have one little post up. So it's called The Fall, The Impact of a Fall. And it is about the ICOC. Wonderful. Oh, that's all really exciting. Okay. Yes. And I love the way you speak. And uh, it is, it is, you speak in poetry and uh, it's beautiful to listen to. Thank you so much for your time today and for your insights and for sharing so much of yourself as a human being, as a survivor of something, as a daughter, and now as a mother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. thing before you go. It is really very, very powerful. When you hear Pam talking about being involved in the ICOC, when you hear her talk about being a therapist and how her mom was a narcissist and her father died, You know, you can hear so much of this overlay of different experiences that have their own trauma and their own drama. And I really love that now she has decided to work with daughters who are estranged from their mothers. And when you're estranged from someone, it doesn't necessarily even mean that that person isn't physically there or isn't physically in touch, you can actually be in the same room as someone and be estranged from them because there isn't that feeling of connection. And it's something that can feel very lonely and hollow when you have a parent who is so self-focused. One of the things that Pam talked about that I thought was interesting just to mention briefly before I get to this next point is the fact that the cultic group provided structure. We want structure. We like when things are ordered to a certain degree. We like when things are predictable to a certain degree. We like when we can have the sense that there are rules and then it's much easier to kind of feel calm within that space because of knowing the expectation because of also being able to have this ability to feel like you can succeed if you follow the structure or if you follow the rules. Of course, what happens within cults eventually, though, is that you're set up to fail. You're not told that at the beginning, but eventually, really, that is what happens, that you can never do it quite right. You can never do it perfectly enough. So I think part of that is the way for the cult leader to control you by having you look inward and try to work harder and blame yourself for things not quite working out, uh, the promises that you've been made not coming true because you just haven't been as devoted to the work, the structure, the rules as you're supposed to be, always berating yourself, always berating yourself. And so when... You have a system like that too, where you can't quite do it right. I then think about how Pam went from out of the frying pan into the fire and then into another fire, how she describes her mother as a narcissist and then got involved in a cult group and then married a husband who she says was a narcissist. This kind of trifecta, this pattern happens quite a bit where you're raised in a certain way with a certain sense about what your role is in relationships and that it doesn't have to do with you getting your needs met at all. And then you can get involved in a cult. Then you get involved in a relationship with someone who mimics that original relationship, the parental relationship. Then when she talked about how 
her narcissistic husband divorced her, it showed her how willing she was to stay with something and tolerate something for longer than was healthy. I hear that a lot when people are in cults and they get kicked out. And then they think to themselves, why did it have to get to that point where I got kicked out? I've been unhappy for a long time there and I knew something was wrong, but I almost couldn't act on my own volition. I couldn't act on my own instinct. I didn't have the bravery. I didn't know really how to take those steps. I didn't know if it was going to be punished by them, by God. And so sometimes people wait until they get kicked out. And then it's hard. It's hard because you have to look at yourself and think, why is it that it took that, that it took someone else to push you out for you to leave? Same thing with when you have a spouse who mistreats you, who makes you have to tolerate things that you shouldn't have to tolerate, and then they're the ones who divorce you. That also happens quite often because the person who is going to be in a relationship with someone who is narcissistic is often someone who is accommodating, is often someone who is very flexible, who is forgiving, who puts themselves second, who is sometimes afraid of saying what they need and acting on it. And so they're often not the ones to file for divorce. They're often not the ones to leave. They have the controller or the abuser be the one to say, okay, I'm done. And then people question themselves. Why did it take the other person to kick me out, to make me leave? But it goes along with the personality that will tolerate that kind of overwhelming, controlling manipulative persona. But it is also a blessing in disguise. So however it is that you are able to be freed, whether you free yourself or by virtue of someone saying, I'm done with you, you're then free. Either way, it is a gift. Take it and run. It is great to meet Pam, get to know her, hear from her. And I hope to be able to talk to her again talk to you next week. Thank you very much for listening. Please support Indoctrination on Patreon at patreon.com slash indoctrination. Be sure to give us a follow on our social media. Find us on Facebook and Instagram using at Indoctrination Podcast. And for Twitter, find us at at underscore Indoctrination. We love hearing from you too. So send us an email at indoctrinationshow at gmail.com. And for more updates on the show, visit our website at www.podpage.com forward slash indoctrination.